Welcome to the 10th class of the course Organizing in Times of Crisis, the case of COVID-19. The focus of this class will be on understanding how the global economy is organized, with really one major underlying question, which is why are Western economies or economies around the world not able to produce the needed supply of critical goods like healthcare protective gear um, or medications? My name is Elke Schüssler. I'm Professor of Business Administration and Head of the Institute of Organization Science at Johannes Kepler University, Linz. I've done quite extensive research on the garment industry and global supply chains there. So I will use some of these examples in trying to outline the risks of global supply chains and also discussing some ideas for how they can be made more resilient. There are three learning aims which also structure this short lecture. First, I want you to understand how global supply chains for different goods and services have developed historically. And I will um, introduce you to these ideas by using two examples. Um, the pharmaceutical supply chain as representative for knowledge intensive goods and the garment supply chain as representative for uh, manufactured goods. Second, I want you to understand how global supply chains are organized and governed um, and to understand some of the complexities that make them so prone to risks. And finally, like I said, I will introduce you to some ideas of how global supply chains can be made more resilient. Let's start by looking at the supply chain for pharmaceuticals. For time reasons, I can only give a very schematic picture here. Um, actually, Harkansson, and I really recommend uh, this article for learning more about the pharma industry, um, argues that there's not one, but three different supply chains in the pharma industry. And I will illustrate these using examples of products that are currently in the headlines. The first strand of pharma production is um, the supply chain for branded products. And an example here would be the vaccine that we all hope for um, to make us immune against the COVID-19 infection. Now, the supply chain for branded products is controlled by the big pharmaceutical companies, usually based in Europe and the United States. And these pharma companies control all the steps of the supply chain. Yeah. Their focus is on research and development, um, engaging in the search for new drugs like the vaccine. And these drugs are usually sold for quite a high price in wealthy markets. Um, so these companies also engage in very intensive marketing and sales activities. You might have heard um, in debates about uh, this vaccine and the complications in developing it, that this process is very complex. It can take up to 10 to 15 years, um, not only because this part, research and development, R&D in short, is very time intensive, um, but also because the regulatory approval itself is very time intensive. Now, when I say that these big pharma companies control the whole supply chain, um, there are some nuances to that. We need to look at manufacturing, for example. Yeah, so who is, if the vaccine um, is developed, for example, who controls the manufacturing? Well, here it is still the pharma companies. Why? Because they own the patents um, and they also therefore want to control the manufacturing process. It doesn't mean that all the manufacturing sites are in Europe or the United States, though. Sometimes manufacturing is offshore to countries like India, for example, which has a very strong pharmaceuticals industry, um, but it would be offshore to fully own subsidiaries. And uh, some nuances are also here in this phase and the clinical testing phase where companies have started um, to outsource, uh, really outsource, um, especially the standardized clinical trials, again, to companies based very often in India. And in the research phase also, um, we need to look a bit beyond the big pharma firms um, because a lot of research now takes place in cooperation with biotechnology startups, also of course in cooperation with universities. So again, here we're moving out of the full vertically integrated supply chain. Once a patent expires, um, a product moves into the second strand, the production of quality generics. So generics are medications for which patents have expired, so everyone can um, produce them. And 
quality generics, an example for which uh, would be the asthma spray, salbutamol, um, which um, is often produced in lower cost production sites. But again, the value chain for these high value generics um, uh, is still very tightly controlled by pharma companies, usually in Western countries. Um, and here, big pharma plays a role, but also many smaller pharma companies that have specialized in the production of generica. Many of these companies, of course, can also be found in, in Asian countries. And the main difference really to the big pharma supply chain is on the one hand that uh, research and development is not as cost intensive as for the branded products. Um, and that um, that the manufacturing part is typically outsourced. And the final strand, um, the example here is chloroquine, the malaria drug. It's the market for so-called low value generics. These are drugs usually used in developing countries to treat tropical diseases. Um, they're very cheap and easy to produce, um, but there are really no revenues to be made. So this market is entirely left to producers based in developing countries. And um, here we don't see the full supply chain. Um, really what we see are factories that do the manufacturing for these drugs and they source the ingredients uh, freely on, on the marketplace. So depending on which supply chain we look at, uh, we, we see different bottlenecks really. And the branded product is the R&D part together with the regulatory approval part. In the quality generics market, it's the manufacturing and the sites where the manufacturing is based and the question of whether they can be scaled up or not, um, or whether the products will be exported or not. I will give an example of that later. Uh, whereas in the final um, case, the bottleneck is really um, the regulatory approval um, because many of these drugs are just not approved in um, all countries around the world. The garment supply chain, in contrast, has even more steps and is even more fine-grained in its global division of labor. Traditionally, again, the companies would control all the steps of the supply chain, planning the collection, designing and prototyping models, buying materials, manufacturing them, marketing and distributing them. The only part that would be missing is the retailing part. Um, so the garment industry would end with a finished product and would sell them to retailers who would sell then sell them to the end customer. Now, even historically, the manufacturing part has um, already been outsourced, not globally, but to families that would help in the sewing process in their homes. Yeah, so this part was always a kind of precarious part of the supply chain. And since the 1960s and 70s, um, of course, we have seen the internationalization of this industry driven by several um, developments simultaneously. On the one hand, um, regulatory incentives um, that have pushed Western garment um, producers to seek lower cost um, locations increased competition from retailers that have themselves begun to source directly uh, manufactured garments from producers based in Hong Kong, for example, um, therefore exerting intensified cost pressure. And um, finally, also because of a shortage of labor willing to engage in garment production because it's a very low paid, low skill activity. So. From this time onwards, we see um, firms that are really uh, focusing on planning their collection, designing and prototyping models, then buying everything um, on the market from suppliers based elsewhere, and then distributing them to retailers. Yeah. We've seen a further shift in this uh, again in recent years with the rise of the so-called new verticals, so companies like H&M and Inditex that are actually retailers, so they've started out as retailers, but retailers that have moved into controlling the production side very closely so that they can um, offer products at a really much higher pace than the industry was used to. Yeah, that's the fast fashion market. And with this rise of the new verticals, there's been another shift again in the supply chain structure um, of dynamics of both backward and forward integration. Yeah, so former producers that have now stopped the manufacturing part 
that focus on planning and designing collections, moving into retailing and opening their own retail stores, or conversely, retailers moving into the manufacturing and assembly part. Yeah? But either way, the manufacturing part um, is really by, by now absolutely globally dispersed, usually taking uh, place in, in Asia to a large bulk, but of course, um, Latin America and also um, Eastern Europe and so on are still very important production sites. I want to briefly illustrate this development with the historical figures. Here you see the number of companies and the number of employees of German garment industry firms and how that number has continuously declined since the 19, mid 1960s onwards. So to summarize, what is behind the fragmentation and internationalization or globalization of value chains? Well, for firms, there are really four motives and I want to keep them separate from the underlying drivers. The first motive is to gain market access either to export markets or to labor markets if there's not a sufficient pool of labor for the production of a particular good in one's own country. Second, of course, there are efficiency considerations, either focusing on cutting costs, production costs, or on focusing on core competences while outsourcing everything else. The third motive would be to gain access to knowledge and expertise that is only available in other locations. And a fourth motivation often is to escape existing regulations and partially also um, to escape responsibility, for example, for labor force and sticking to basic um, labor regulations. None of these are really driving, fully driving the intensity of the globalizing dynamic we have seen in the past two decades, however. The main drivers here, as we've seen in the examples before, um, really is the regulatory framework, the process of trade liberalization that we've observed. And um, the World Trade Organization has, of course, played a key role in this. Um, critical events for knowledge intensive uh, goods like uh, the pharmaceutical industry has been the WTO TRIPS agreement drafted in 1994 regulating um, the protection of, of um, patents, of copyrights and in manufacturing industries, the WTO membership of China in 2001 has really been a critical point from which on huge amounts of manufacturing capacities have been moved to China. And from there, as China itself has um, upgraded into other sectors, um, they're moving out into other countries like um, in the garment industry, Bangladesh, for example. And this process of trade liberalization went hand in hand with intensified global competition, forcing firms to really, on the one hand, um, concentrate more to gain more bargaining power, to gain more buying power, while at the same time um, focusing on cutting production costs. Yeah? So the four motives outlined above um, really need to be seen in relationship to these main drivers. And of course, information technology has been a key facilitator of these dynamics. Let's now move towards unpacking some of the key concepts along which global supply chains are analyzed. First, there are different names. I'm using here the colloquial um, term supply chain, but in the academic literature, you will find terms like global commodity chains, global value chains, global value networks, and global production networks. And all of these mean slightly different things. But these nuances uh, don't have to concern you here. What's important is that all these terms seek to express that um, global supply chains are much more than the flows of goods. Um, they are socially constructed and highly dynamic entities. The main actors in global supply chains are lead firms and su their suppliers. Lead firms are the firms that occupy the central position in the supply chain and that drive the supply chain. And the suppliers are the companies from which the lead firms source their goods and services. And the relationship between lead firms and suppliers usually takes the shape of a network. This is why um, the terminology has really moved away from thinking about chains, supply chains, towards thinking about supply networks, value networks, production networks. 
The key distinction, that's the third point, is that between buyer-driven and producer-driven value chain. This terminology has been coined by uh, Gary Giraffe to pinpoint at the power differentials inherent in different supply chains. Buyer-driven supply chains are those in which large retailers have the more powerful role, so the ones buying and then selling the goods or, or services. Um, and here we're talking about companies like Walmart or Tesco, as well as highly branded um, merchandisers like Nike or Adidas. And these buyers really um, play a key role in shaping and dictating um, the rules for their suppliers. In contrast, producer-driven supply chains are those, as the term says, where producers of goods or services have the main role because they have critical, often technological knowledge. Um, so they're more powerful than the buyers at the end of the chain. A fourth very important concept is that of governance. Governance, uh, very generally speaking, means coordination. And a central question is, of course, who is governing these supply chains? A large bulk of the literature focus here on lead firms as those actors in charge of governing. Um, and the focus here really lies on understanding the relationship between buyers and suppliers, which can take different forms. The relationship can be market-based. Um, it can be hierarchical, as in the example I gave of fully owned subsidiaries, or it can be something in between, truly network kinds of relationship with um, varying nuances. They can be relational, yeah, meaning that buyers and suppliers are very much codependent, um, or they can be captive, meaning that basically a supplier is highly dependent on a buyer because there are multiple other suppliers, as in the garment industry, that can produce the same product. The final concept um, is the concept of upgrading, uh, which is related to, of course, the recognition that power in global supply chains is very unequally distributed. And upgrading refers to the strategies used by firms, but also by countries and regions um, to really try to improve their position in the global economy. Now, um, I will now give you two reasons of why contemporary supply chains are so prone to risk. Bearing in mind what I said before, yeah, the overall underlying driver of globalization is intense global competition based on which supply chains are built towards maximum efficiency, minimum costs, of course, with some variation across industry. So the first um, complexity is that if you start to unpack it and move from this chain-like picture that I showed you at the beginning towards looking at the actual interorganizational networks that lie behind these global um, production flows, we see here a hugely complex picture. This is again a stylized depiction of the typical garment production network where we see lead firms, retailers that have subsidiaries own sourcing offices, maybe own um, uh, manufacturing sites even, that have key suppliers to which they have very close so-called relational ties. But these suppliers, of course, have a whole set of sub-suppliers who further then subcontract the production flows. And we're talking here about up to 1,000 suppliers for some of the large retailers whose, whose brand names you will know. So these relationships are extremely fine-grained. You don't see here the global scale, but you can be sure that all these different triangles are based in different countries and spread around the world. And often even the lead firms themselves, they don't have a full picture of what the details of their supply chain look like because of the subcontracting relationships that go on here. The second complexity, um, stems from what political scientists would refer to as a regulatory gap. Okay, so there's no world government that can decide how global supply chains should be organized. And um, there are, of course, multiple collective action problems between lead firms that compete with each other, suppliers that compete with each other, and countries that compete with each other for having the largest share and the highest revenue in this global economy. 
There are international regulations, of course, like the OECD's uh, guidelines for corporate responsibility, for example, but these are usually non-binding. And the trade agreements, I've referred to them before, they really focus on market protection or liberalization, depending um, on which angle you look at. Um, and they don't really focus on ensuring resilience or responsibility. So this leaves the lead firms, usually multinational um, enterprises, with the task of having to compete on the one hand, but on the other hand, try to build up resilience, responsibility, um, sustainability, and so on. And you can imagine that, of course, um, the competitive pressure always prevails, and even the companies with the best intentions face their limits um, in, in terms of making their supply chains more responsible, more resilient, if this comes at the cost of kind of losing out in the competitive market. As a result, we see that global production really is a highly contested and complex political arena, an arena of contestation, which has very little to do with the neatly neat boxes I've shown you on the first slides. Um, the network of firms constituting the global production chain or network is only just a part of it. Um, there are multiple agencies and other organizations, nation states, labor representatives, but of course also consumers and civil society trying to shape the structure and nature of these supply chains and all of that embedded in an uneven geographical distribution of power and wealth. Let's now look at some examples of the current crisis and see what they tell us about the global supply chain. Um, the first example I want to give is uh, that of India ordering the stop of exports of certain medicines that are produced in the country, like, for example, chloroquine. Well, this clearly tells us that supply chains are a political issue and that states, governments actually have quite a huge role to play in shaping the contours of the global economy. Second, here's an example of Hugo Boss um, that just is representative for many other companies that have now stepped up and said we're engaging in the production of critical goods like face masks, like overalls that doctors can wear and so on. Now Hugo Boss and some other companies are able to do this because they have retain, retained some manufacturing capacity. Companies that have outsourced everything are simply not able to do this. And why these capacities um, might be considered as slack, as redundancy in good times, they might be really critical if there's a need to respond more flexibly to changing demands. A third example here um, is an open document that has been shared uh, across the world, gaining with instructions about how to make a mechanical ventilator. So this indicates we don't just rely on big companies, we also rely on activists, on local communities, and on openly shared knowledge if we want to make so supply chains more sustainable. And a final example I want to give here um, is that of a British retailer, fashion retailer, which again just is representative for a host of other companies that have done the same thing, which has cancelled orders in huge amounts, um, leaving their suppliers basically without orders, sitting on pre-orders materials for which the retailers do not take any responsibility and leaving the workers without any income. So this shows us that while everyone, of course, bears a risk and is affected by these crises, including the large retailers, the risks are shared very unevenly across the whole supply chain with workers um, and the suppliers they work at usually being the weakest end. So what can we do to make supply chains more resilient? I've summarized here again some of the key risk factors, um, which I won't go through in detail again. I think it has become clear that the main driver for all of these risk factors lie in the enhanced competitiveness um, demands, and uh, which has led companies to design their supply chains based on the principle of lean production, um, 
streamlining them for maximum efficiency, often accompanied by a process where there's a focus on core competences and outsourcing everything else to um, production locations, often selected um, for cost, but of course, increasingly also for reliability considerations. And this can result in extreme resource dependence on critical suppliers, which, um, as we've seen in the India example, can then, um, of course, be also controlled politically should a crisis like the current one occur. So we're talking about massive resource dependencies here. Some of the solutions I see are um, first and foremost to really take what is called a whole network perspective on governing supply chains. So think back on the triangles, the picture with the triangles I've shown you on the garment supply chains. A resilient supply chain can only be built by taking a systemic view on the different links in this chain and coming up with an intelligent mix of the different governance modes of buying, of cooperating, and of an intelligent mix of what is produced locally and globally, what is sourced locally and globally, that allows for redundancy and that keeps control over critical skills to some extent. A big help in this, of course, are new technologies like 3D printing. Again, you may have seen examples of um, face masks now also being printed in plastic from 3D printers, not as a replacement of the manufacturing of the, of the textile masks, but as a complement in times where the textile masks cannot be delivered. So this helps us in building up these complementary, partially redundant competencies. Of course, um, a third point, it's important to strengthen rather than to weaken global governance institutions. I've mentioned the critical role of governance and the problems in governing these global supply chains and global institutions like the International Labour Organization or like the WHO are really the only ones that can exert a regulatory influence on the global scale if we strengthen them rather than weaken them. And they are the ones, um, as my own research in the garment industry has shown, that really can help to facilitate solving some of the collection, collective action problems uh, buyers as well as suppliers face. Of course, changing the regulatory framework so that it's not just focused on competition, often cost competition, um, but also that takes uh, the sustainable development goals, for example, into account will be absolutely crucial. And um, only sustained stakeholder pressure can help here in holding our governments in different countries around the world accountable for, for changing these regulations. And a final point I want to make is a term uh, that colleagues from the NYU Stern University use. It's the concept of sharing responsibility, not just shifting risks downwards um, to the weakest link in the supply chain, but really bringing together buyers and suppliers and the governments in which these buyers and suppliers are based to together force them to come up with a mode in which responsibility along all the different dimensions we have resilience, sustainability, fair labor, and so on can be assured. So to sum up, three key points. States have a key role to play in setting the rules of the game of the global economy. And because of that, supply chains need not just be seen as economic relationships for the exchange of goods, but really as political arenas. The current structure of global supply chains bears several risks for lead firms, for suppliers, for workers and consumers as well, regarding product safety, um, for example. But these risks are clearly unequally distributed along the chain. And resilience can really be gained by taking a more systematic whole networks perspective on managing these global supply chains. And this perspective also means involving stakeholders and sharing responsibilities. Thank you very much for your attention. Of course, you can get in touch with me with feedback or further questions, and please refer to the reference list or the course outline for background literature.